it's the physical side that will have drawn you. When you were yeah. younger, you were probably good at football or sport, and then you thought, mm-hmm. I like this because I get to punch people. That's probably that's people. probably like the rest of the world, or all, all these snowflakes that yeah. you know. Oh, we've got we've got to protect everybody. Well, no, it's a physical game, and and, yeah. I, and I get you do everything you can for the welfare of the players, but there's got to be there is a certain amount of of risk. That's that comes with the nature of the sport. Uh, you're on podcast with me, John Levin, Anthony Ellis, and the legend Paul Sculthorpe in your house, which is lovely, Paul. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nice to take your shoes off as well. But, uh, before we get into your career, what do you think of the Toronto situation? What have you made of that? Yeah, it's um, you know it's it's unfortunate, really. Um, you know, obviously they were they were a big pull into into Super League. Um, obviously, you know, people speak speak about the game and, and branching out and expanding. And, you know, there was a guy, David Argyle, who wanted to, to do that in Toronto. You know, there's, there's been a lot of noise made about it. You know, they've, they've spent a lot of money. Obviously, you know, the, the big money signing of, of Sonny Bill Williams. And it just doesn't seem to have worked. Um, obviously, the, there's a lot of there's a lot of issues with him, with him being over over in Canada. And and obviously, you know, this worldwide pandemic is has not helped anybody. And it, I think it's just put... Um, made things even worse for, for these guys and obviously they're not being able to to feel the side. Um, you know, they're not under the same rules as, as most Super League clubs into in, in regards to funding. Um, so there was a limit on what players they had at the beginning of the year. You know, there was talk, you know, what were we, six games in, I think, before the, the pandemic hit, that, Catalan, uh, that Toronto were virtually on bare bones of, of players then. Yeah. But yeah. then obviously after this, there's been certain issues with, with visas, uh, and they've, they've been able to, um, unable to, to fill the side, so it's um, yeah, it's it's not good. It's not good to be honest, because as I said, you know, there was a lot of excitement about Toronto and and you know spreading the the, the, the wide net of, of rugby league. What, what what was that? Is it purely a financial uh, like a bit of everything, wasn't it? It's a bit. It's a bit of everything, you know. Um, you know, uh, David Argyle, who's, who's the owner, has, has no doubt put a lot of his own money in him because right. Toronto funded. Obviously, visiting sides going over. You know, he's done that from from day one in right. you know in the, in the in League One and Championship, um, and then then in Super League. So there's been a, a big cost to him. Um, you know what he's worth. I don't know. You, you hear different things. Supposedly a billionaire, and so then you say how, how financially. You know how much trouble are they in, and mm. you know how much is he prepared to go. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know it is what it is, and you know we've. Uh, I don't know. It's still to be decided what's uh, what's going to happen with them. Right. Could they not like put like because I'm from Cumbria? Is there no chance they could get the players that are left over from Toronto, ones out the national leagues, Cumbrian players, and just like, have well, a Cumbrian team or something like that, just to play out yeah. the league games? I mean, I mean, I think there's been a, I think there's been a number of uh, solutions thrown at, at Toronto, uh, and that was one of them. Derek Beaumont from Lee has said that he'll lend him, you know, six to ten players or whatever yeah. at the cost to Lee. They'll pay the wages because it's a lot of these clubs, and, and and that's one of my issues with the game at the moment is is not having this reserve grade. Yeah. That you've got thirty players in your top squad. There's only seventeen can play, mm. so there's a lot not playing anyway. So I'm sure that if if they wanted to, that Toronto could find players either on loan or or, or you know players lent to uh, to them to, to fulfil fixtures but it's obviously it's 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 not the second be. team that ruined rugby league in a lot of ways didn't it? because that's what like people like Jamie Peacock if there wasn't a second team he would have never played Super League yeah, he'd yeah. have been lost to the game and well you know at the moment the academy dropped from from 19 to 18 last year because it's a three year age gap you know when you come through scholars and you, you start at 16 so you could be a young 16 year old playing against an old 19 year old in, in the academy yeah. which was too old so a lot of them first year 16s weren't playing now again, how do you develop when you're not playing? Yeah, you need to play, and and there's too many players not playing. So they dropped that to 18s last year with bringing the reserve grade back because obviously 19s then yeah, they can play. They're men, mm. you know, they're playing in the reserve grade along with the the players who are in the first team squad who have not picked. So you you're developing them players playing with better players anyway. But obviously due to this, the, the, they're saying now that, that that can't be funded and, uh, and and reserves has been scrapped for 2021. And the, the loan system never worked, did it? You know, like a Super League club. I just, don't, I just don't think it's fair because you, you've got championship players who train, train for their three club, or four and, times and then a week, you know, yeah. your likes of Saints and Warrington and Wigan flirt a, a couple of players their way, and, and they're supposedly, you know, have got to play. Uh, they have to um, play. That's a difference. Yeah, isn't it? and and 
I don't know. I don't know whether there's a, there's a long term solution doing it correctly. It's, it's what they do in the the NRL. So a lot of the feeder clubs are from like the Q Cup or the uh, the, the New South Wales League. But these are these. This is something that's organised. You know that 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 players know where they're going to play and what their feeder club is. Because you, you you only got into rugby league like everyone else, weren't you? Your dad and I taking you to the game. It's changed a lot, hasn't it? The last ten years, I think watching rugby league's changed and how it's advertised and things like. I, I feel like rugby league's a bit of a, a turning point. If it doesn't go the same way as like MMA and darts, and I think it's going to go less and less, especially spectator wise. And we talked about this before about yeah. how to advertise the game a bit better. And it feel like it, it almost feels insular. It's it's like if you're not part of it now, then yeah, you're never yeah. going to be part of it. It yeah. doesn't it doesn't feel inclusive. Like they don't it doesn't feel as though they're trying. Yeah, to like, that's the frustrating thing more. with the game. I think because you know we've just been saying then as well off off camera that as a product to watch the entertainment for yeah. me it's it's the best game in the world. Yeah. You know it's got everything. It's got speed, agility. It's got skill. It's got bash. You know, people love that physicality side of it. It's it's a brilliant game to watch, mm. but it is it's just under undersold. And um, you know, whether it's people think oh it's it's only it's only played in the M sixty two corridor, you know, and uh, but it's not. You know, it's 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 played all over the all over the country, all over Europe, all over the world. Um, but it just needs to be marketed better. No, and like is. you say, you know, you talk about the change in like snooker, darts, things like yeah. that. With like, I mean, obviously. Rugby League have spoke to to the Hearns and, and Match Room about getting involved, and that's something that, that's that's never come off. But obviously, they know that that this is something that we need to do, like the salary cap and things. Like that. I don't think that helps Rugby League because no one's really that bothered about it. If Marwan Kukash wants to come in by battling, <laughs> correct, bring you out of retirement, Sam Burgess or something like that. Well, He's got the money. Do you know what? That's that's how do you attract? How do you attract people with with money to invest into the game? You know, they, if they if they're going to invest their own money, you know, very wealthy people, they want to be successful. But you can't buy success when you you when you're governed on on what you can only spend. Yeah. Um, and certainly, you know, the current salary cap is nowhere near big enough to. It's a lot of the players are going to Australia, aren't they? The top players now, like you've never seen as many players in the Super League go to. Australia. Yeah, I mean, there is, but there, but there's also you know there's a lot of great players who are turning down the NRL to stay in Super League, and there's, there's you know there's some top Aussies who have come over to, to play in Super League. You look at like so, uh, John Bateman next year, who's who's turned down offers in the NRL to come back to Wigan. So you know, Super League can can hold world class players. Um, what we need is more of them, and you know, m- more reason for for kids to want to play rugby league. Well, it's the same with kids rugby league. My mates, kids just started rugby league, and he said they're playing tag. And I thought, even from like a young age, we were playing tag because I was a fat lad as a nine-year-old. You really, we were, really was. I was like, <laughs> I was like the honey boy kid. Yeah. If we were playing tag, I just wouldn't play because there would be no gaps big enough yeah, yeah. to go through. Yeah. Whereas uh, I, it's a physical side that will draw you. When you were yeah. younger, you were probably good at football, all sports, and then you thought, I like this because I get to punch people. That's probably that's people. probably like the rest of the world or all these snowflakes that yeah. you know. Oh, we've got we've got to protect everybody. Well, no, it's a physical game, and and, yeah. I, and I get you do everything you can for the welfare of the players, but there's got to be there, there is a certain amount of of risk. That's that comes with the nature of the sport, and uh, you know, like you say with the, the young kids, I'm all for for upskilling kids. You know, play do lots of skill, do lots of drills, do lots of games, make it fun, and and for me, tackling is part of that. At a certain age, you know, there's, there's got to be a welfare thing as well. Um, but like I say, it's, you know, we, we want as many kids playing the game and, and also re- retaining these people in the well, game. You, you see on YouTube and stuff, don't you? Like best try or two hundred thousand views. Paul Scopo having a fight with Andy Fell, two million views. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to be scientists to say what are people interested yeah, in. Here? And yeah. I, it's the same with the adverts for Super League. It used to be back. In the day, it was like a couple of shoulder barges, yeah. a few big hits, and with that music, the old Super League music, and it was yeah. quite exciting, wasn't it? And I feel like now that they've gone away from that a little bit, like the skill level, I, I like how they score the tries like Tommy Makins and yeah. things. That's improved the game. Yeah, yeah. But I feel like you lean on the, the rough side a little yeah. bit more, especially advertising it. I think what you'll attract that, like, a lot of people that watch boxing, MMA, they get caught up in the hype, yeah, of course don't they? Do, do you yeah. know what I mean? Sometimes it'll last well, 25 I, I, seconds. I don't know if you've seen the, uh, the, the relaunch of the, the NRL one. Yeah, this year, yeah, you know, yeah. and that was that that like showed a bit of history of the game, and, and a lot of that was, you know, probably eighty ninety percent of that video was people whacking each other and yeah. you know a few a few dust ups and, and what have you. Now we we can't we can't come down violence. No, that's you, you know, it's, it, yeah. it's, but you can't sanitize a sport where the name of the game is to is to get on top of your opposition. Yeah. You know, it, within the rules, but sometimes taking them rules just over the edge. Yeah. But it's. 
it's a physical game and we can't yeah. we can't lose that. We can't lose that because that's what attracts people to, to rugby league. Well, when I was growing up, it would be people like yourself and Vila, Metallic, all these people, they're running to go through the line. It was sort of like, I'm going to elbows, knees. And sometimes I watch now, not all players, but there's a lot more of a landing gear that I'm going to find me elbows, yeah. knees. And, and the, game, the game's work. definitely changed on that side of things in regards to how the game's played. And, you know, a lot of it, I am involved at the top, like with the England setup and, it frustrates you when you watch and, and like people are playing for like the next play. It's yeah. you know it's a lot. Of, there's a lot of structure within within the game, um, and it, that's for me. That's been been great working with, with Sean Wayne certainly over the over the probably the last six months um, with the senior stuff because he's somebody who you know it's all about that one play at the time. And if you can run over somebody and run through somebody, then you do it. You don't try and get a quick play of the ball to up the next guy. It's not about that. Obviously, if if you tackle, then you do the best things technique wise to to do that. But it's not playing with too much structure. You play what's in front of you, and if you know if somebody calls the ball and the ball goes the other way because you know they they've got numbers, then rightly so that that should happen. You know, it's it's playing what they see rather than playing what they've decided at the beginning of that set what they're going to do. Do you think it's an Australian thing? Because when yeah, hundred percent copy yeah, everything there. I think if Australia started playing with one sock on, we'd start doing it. <laughs> Do you think it's just gone. Well, that it is. Flat? That, that's the way I always said. Like when it, probably when I was playing, I, I wasn't really hung up on watching the NRL because it, no, it, it bored me. It was yeah. it was quite. You know, you look at them now, and we we we've done quite a bit over the last few months on on like what we want from the England side and how we want them to play and what we want them to do. And, and a lot is like you know your last tackle play, you kick, you kick in to compete. When you watch the NRL and it's literally, they'll, they'll kick downfield, you know, more often than not catch it on the full. It's just about that arm wrestle, you know, about complete your sets, not necessarily what you do or, or try yeah. and score. And, um, yeah, I don't know, it kind of, it kind of frustrates me as, as well as a, as a coach and, and a, as an ex-player where, you know, we want to score. I, I played at probably the best club in the world for wanting to score on every player. At St. Helens. With Ian Millwood. And yeah, and we, yeah, you know, and, we, and we've scored some spe- spe- spectacular tries. And, um, yeah, sometimes when you, you're playing just to compete, you know, it's uh, it's frustrating. Well, I remember the back end when I was playing, you go train and I'd say 90%, maybe 95% was just defence. So that's all you do, like yardage and getting your hips in the right spot. And, pl- and I feel like people have forgot the attack a little bit. And mm. when I watch it now, you think... All you see is one through, one on the back, yeah, one yeah, through, one yeah, on yeah. the back, miss one to the winger. And that, yeah. that seems to be the and, attack. And when, when you watch that and, you, you know, you say, you know, you have the, we call them leads and options, yeah, so, yeah. you know, you, you, you lead. And half of them players are going through the motions of, of doing that. They're not a genuine threat. Yeah. So I think your best teams, you know, I watch Saints, you know, in the first game back yeah. at, at weekend against Catalan. And that's something I commented. We are on a, an England WhatsApp group and I just, you know, every player was, was running with intent. You know, we're, we're genuine. Everyone was a genuine option, well, and, and it doesn't thing. half make a difference because defenders have got to be accountable. Then, yeah, yeah. Right, it, like the St. Elms and Castleford, especially the last two or three years, they just look different teams, don't they? When they're they throw the ball about, yeah, and, and yeah. I think that's that's. You look at probably well the last three four years in regards to who've been the most consistent team throughout. Obviously, Cass got league leaders what two thousand eighteen. Yeah, Saints got it nineteen. Or sorry, Cass seventeen, Saints eighteen nineteen. And for me, it's that for that reason. You know, they, they play football. Yeah. You never see, like, uh, well, the problem is as well with amateur teams, they've copied Super League now. So I'll go and watch a second team, Rugby League, and they're doing yardage. Yeah, yeah. You could run around that wing. It's but the thing, but the, thing is, the thing is, with these, <laughs> I've, I've did a coaching session for an under 10 team, and they're doing the same. And yeah. you go, do you know why you're doing that? And they don't. The coaches don't don't know it, but but they see it on a Friday night. And this is where a lot of community coaches. And this this is where for me where the game can improve in in regards to you know your top coaches at professional clubs working with the community rather than taking them away for these scholarships. I'm not a fan of scholarships and taking them away from from playing opportunities at, at community rugby. Is work with the community teams, make the community teams, make everybody stronger. You know and and better coach and also upskill the coaches as well who have got these kids three days a week you know in, in regards to the little things that they do Paul Anderson did a did a great uh, presentation to, to community coaches and he showed a try and it was it was a cast try yeah and it was you know he called it a big picture play so it was like you know it went through probably 10 pair of hands fantastic try and they pulled it back and he went right tell me now the detail in that and they, they can't 
what they don't see is a perfect play of the ball, a great dummy yeah, half pass yeah. that he catches it on the, you know, on the, on the on the fly, great catch, straight lines are running, so you're holding defenders up, and all the little things that that you practice, you know, and and even all your top teams practice week in week out, day in day out, because if you can't do the little detail, the skill, then the big picture stuff doesn't come off. Especially for the younger lads as well, isn't it? You know, like That's when it. you get to 14, 16, you start learning your lines and yeah, things yeah. like that. But an under nine does not know how to land for a quick play of the ball and stuff. You know, yeah, yeah. you should be learning how to pass. He should be, he should be learning how to catch the ball off his chest and, you know, and, and good lines of passing and, you know, little little things, holding defenders, like being able to play straight rather than drifting to the person that you, you're playing. I was like, that was passing crap. Passing to and <laughs> Absolute crap. But it, it's, it's little things, and it, you know, it's, it sounds quite technical, but it's not. It's it's the little things. But you're putting that into fun-based games, certainly when the kids, and and just drilling, you know, them them little details that make all this big picture stuff. Because whether you're a, you're an under-10s at, at Rosebridge in Wigan or you're a, a Great Britain international, the little things are the same. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's quite it's not a complicated game. It's quite a simple game as rugby league. It was for me, Paul. I played twice and I did not enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> Arguably the worst. Was that, was, was that the physical side of it? Or? Well, 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 like the first I I played like uh, I I moved up to Cumbria uh, like um, when I was ten, and I was pretty much forced that like like once I became mid twenties I was pretty Is much that forced. Since was nine? <laughs> so yeah, you, like... can, you can't live up in Cumbria and not play rugby league. Well, well I, I, I was forced to play the first game, and the first time I got it, everyone went. Run, run! And I and I just seen these lads coming at me. I thought, Nah, that's not for me. <laughs> Pass the ball straight away. And then the second time, like, remember, remember what happened when I was on the wing? It was outside the touch when I got past. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm here. I'm looking. I'm going. Why are the coaches to the left hand side? I'm <laughs> and I just thought, Nah, it's not for me. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you find out pretty quickly when you're younger who's going to be good at rugby and stuff like that. It's normally the ones that are a bit mental. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? Because yeah. it's a, it is a crazy sport, yeah. isn't it? You're getting into a sport where if you get to the very top, you're not going to be a multimillionaire. But you're guaranteed to get hurt <laughs> and stuff like that. Whereas if you do football, even if you're average, you're going to get paid really well. Whereas rugby yeah. league, it's just one of them. And we were talking about rugby league after playing sport. There's so many people in rugby league that, that don't take that next step. Like, what we're we going to do after rugby mm. league? Like, how many people get to like 34 and like, oh, I can't play anymore? Yeah, and they yeah. haven't even thought yeah, yeah, about the next yeah. part of the future. And no, no, and that, that's it. And that's that's probably gone gone better over the years with within the game in regards to you know focusing on, on life after sport and and ex-players who have got involved with that side of things to try and pass on that message to the younger players because you know you should know that and 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 the more physical it gets and 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 probably not in the games because for me there is probably less contact but the training you know the the, the demand on training has probably got more um and, and if people people are you know are getting bigger and faster the, the collisions are going to be more and uh, so you know Career age is only going to keep coming down, you know, with 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 injuries. So certainly, when you're coming through in the game, you need to know that there's a long life after playing rugby where you've got to earn. Which was the best coach at you worked? Because you started in uh, was it Warrington <coughs> first professional? Team? Yeah, yeah. What was it like back in there? Was it Daryl Van der Velde and like Paul? Well, Paul it, Cullen, originally, like that? yeah, but Brian Johnson was my was my first coach at, at Warrington. Um, yeah, Brian was. I mean, he was he was brilliant, great with me and. He gave me my, my first opportunity. Um so yeah, it was it was great coming through that, you know, playing alongside the, the likes of Jonathan Davis. Yeah, um, yeah. you know, as a as a sixteen, seventeen year old kid was uh, was real special. Because that was Widderspill then as well, wasn't Widdespill, it? yeah, yeah. Because that was some pitch, wasn't it? It was always sand and stuff. Yeah, like yeah, that, but... yeah. Well yeah. they called it the zoo. That was that was its nickname, the zoo. Because it was a uh, I mean obviously Warrington Previous to to me, I always had real physical sides and had a few lunatics in their uh, in the time playing there. And a, a team that where you knew that when you go to Wilderspool, you're always in for a physical game. Well, I, I can remember like growing up watching Super League, and back then, if you look at the highlights from Super League then to now, there's so many more full lengths, bit more like size set and up your cell. Like in that team alone, how many people you class as like Mavericks, isn't it? You know, yeah, people yeah, do yeah. some off yeah. the cuff. That's I think that you said there was there was a lot less structure in them and, and and a lot more you know throw the ball about so opportunities you know opened up and it's a lot uh, rougher as well. I, I liked it when like Super League you'd have teams they would have one hard bastard they'd have a hard bastard <laughs> they would go at it you'd have two wingers <laughs> fast as now else classy halfbacks loose forwards like you said like a do ball yeah, yeah, bit of rough yeah. bit of skill whereas now a lot of them you could say they look like an old second row quite fast can run a line. 
even wingers now they're all like yeah, massive. yeah, like, yeah. They look they're at all, Jason they're all yeah, they, 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 it's definitely it's definitely changed in, in regards to that you know, like you said you, know, you could look at a player now and say he plays rugby league and you wouldn't know what, what, what position well I, that, I would, that's what I was going to that's what I wanted to mention before because I'm sure I remember as a kid watching it like watching old games of I'm sure I can remember like seeing like the occasional chubby fella on the team or like, yeah, like yeah. you know like the occasional fat fat prop yeah, on that well, like, well like saying but, like, you, you pick them as I, a prop I just now it's all 6 3 yeah. 6 4 and, and the way the game's shit. going is even is going to be even more so I mean yeah. I if you say you've seen the games at weekend the, the new rule changes so they brought in the 6 again rule so if it's a if it's an obvious penalty rather than stopping play and you know referee blowing the whistle it just puts a, the tackle count back to zero so you know you might get to the fifth tackle as a defender one of your teammates gives you a penalty, you're back to zero. So you could, you know, there were the times at, uh, at weekend, and it, and it certainly cost Catalan, you know, a lot of energy uh, in, in discipline, giving back to six. You know, they might have done 18 tackles on the on the spin. Yeah. Um, so because of that, you, you know, you, your bigger fellows or your, your props and, and back rowers, they're only going to get more athletic and, and and smaller because I don't think there's there's much demand for, for, for the big fellows anymore. Yeah. I always think that was a difference when you used to play Australia, New Zealand. Never, never thought like the team was worse. It was just that they play the ball, they'd fall asleep. You know, holding down, they were like peeling off so much better at that side of the game. Whereas we were still trying to play with a bit of skill and things. I think, like you said, just boring each other to death. I think, I think if they can get that play the ball sorted, I think against Australia it'd be a lot more even. Yeah, I think, uh, I think in the past as well, what we've had, we've had issues with two sets of rules yeah, uh, yeah. And that's one thing I've never got with, with rugby league is well we've got three sets of rules so we've got a, a super league set of rules or UK um, and Australian and NRL and then you've got international rules that are, that are completely different again you know it's, it's one game I've one set of rules and I think that's something that I know we're working for I'm on the, I'm on the laws committee at, at, at the RFL and I know that's something that the channel liaise with with the NRL and, and the um, international committee of, of just trying to get one set of rules do you think we'll ever be more dominant than Austria? Because it's been a few, like we were talking about before and about copying them and things, like you and Sean Wayne, both I just think sort of the, the, the hardest thing with, with that is, is the pool of players that we've got. Our, you know, our national sport over in this country is football. Yeah. You know, a lot of majority of kids, when, when they grow up, they want to be footballers. Whereas in Australia, NRL is their number one sport. So kids are growing up wanting to play, you know, rugby league. So the, the pool of players, I think when we see that, in, in the NRL, the, the quality of, of the player. Our best 17 and their best 17, there's nothing in it. I think the World Cup final proved that and, and, and I think we've, we've still got a better team than, than what we proved that day. Um, that's why I was really, really excited about the Ashes series at the back end of this year. Certainly with Wayne on board now and I just think he'll, he'll pick the right team because he knows the players. He's watching the players week in, week out uh, and I think, you know, we had a really, really good chance of, of winning the Ashes series. Who, who was the best player you played against in international level? Because you played against Wiki and people like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, played, I've played against them all. I mean, um, you know, likes of Gordon Tallis, Andrew Johns. But two I always say is, is probably Darren Lockyer and, uh, and Brad Fittler. Right, right. Um, two players who just had everything. I mean, Lockyer was, he went from the world's best fullback to the world's best standoff and, um, you know, a phenomenal player throughout his, his career. And, and Freddie Fittler as well. You know, he had he had everything. Um you know, he was Australian captain when I when I come through, and just somebody who had every single asset of the game. And did you ever think like uh, they picked the right teams back in the day? Because I remember Lee Breeze, probably a friend of yours. I would have liked to see someone like even him on the bench. You know, if it was getting tight, and just so he would have just done something. Maybe yeah, I think uh, I think that, you know, there's, there's been a number of players like that: Lee, Lee Breeze, Tommy Martin. Tommy um, Martin, yeah. Yeah, in regards to Brazy, you know, I think a bit of first to tell you, I think some of his probably his off field antics and, and the way he lived his life at that time didn't do him any favours in regards to, to getting picked for, for international honours. Now you picked um, me interest by what was he up to? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, Brazy will tell you, you know, he's, 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 he's done them himself and, 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 and explained, yeah, nothing bad, but mm. just probably wasn't as committed as he was in the back end of his, mm. his career. Uh, it was a bit of a. You're not under the spotlight in rugby league as much, are you? Like it's like when I see interviews on Super League, they're like, "Oh yeah, looking forward to getting in the gym this week." They think strippers and cocaine do it. You know what I mean? Like it's, <laughs> it's a mix, isn't it? They haven't got the same like football where they can like you could go to a local nightclub as long as you don't do some. Yeah, I mean we're, we're very lucky. Like you say, you can make a good living and 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 you know have that that profile, but you can also live a normal life as well. 
Was it hard for you? Because you were dead professional as playing. Because Sean Long, his book will tell you, he's a bit, he's a bit mental, isn't he, yeah. as well? Yeah. Was it hard to be so professional when they're sort of saying, like, oh, well, let's go out on a Monday afternoon and, and stuff like that? And... No, no, do you know what? Players were, and certainly Longy, you know, he, yeah, he was mad. He was, he was mad at training. Um, but that's the kind of character that he is, and probably the, the kind of character that made him, you know, probably the best player in the, in the world in his position um, at that time. But when it there was nobody more committed to 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 his performance and, and, and doing you know things right that are not going to affect his game. Um, so when he went out for a beer, it was at the right time. He just, had, <laughs> just <laughs> did it a bit more than everybody else. <laughs> Some people need that though, don't they? I was yeah, of course. That. Do you know what? And that's what made him what, yeah. he, what he was and, and made him the character was. And, and, and to, talking about Brazy as well, you know, him the same. You know, very. Um, what's the word? Like when they were on the field, they, they, they didn't play by rules. They they they, they played what they see and like what, Mavericks. You know, Mavericks, yeah, Mavericks. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the word I'm looking for. Um, yeah, just Mavericks. And, but, but, but that's but that's what made them because you know they could see things that other people couldn't see. And um, as you say, you know, Longy was he was he was a great professional, great trainer. But like I say, when he when he went out, he went out. <laughs> but, 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 that, but that's the same in any sport though, isn't it? You, you, you forgive someone that kind of thing as long as they go out on a Saturday or a Sunday. Of course, and yeah. Like, like, and yeah. Do you know what? We all, we all did. We all went out. Yeah, they, you know, people are different, just different kind of characters. Don't mean yeah. we all didn't, didn't do the same sort of stuff. But yeah, um, yeah there's right times and wrong times to do in it. And I think the best thing that we had at Saints was was the respect of your peers. I think that we, we, we were very player-led. So that players felt accountable to, to the teammates, you know, to do things right. So you won't need coaches or or, or or board members, you know, giving you a roasting for, you know, going out on the piss on a Thursday when you've got a game on Saturday because players wouldn't do that. Yeah. Um, you know, and that, that's the best thing that I think that we had at the club. But if they play well, does it make a difference? Like the papers always, like I watch that Euro 96 with Gaza and people like that, oh, they went out two weeks before the Euros, you're like... They're twenty-year-old lads. They're not robots, are they? And they've got loads of no, money. No, so you, you've got to have thing, a life. Of course you have. And the thing is, you've got to enjoy what you're doing, or it's yeah. you know, it's no fun in doing it. Um, so yeah, I think you, you, you've got to enjoy yourself. Um, but there's 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 a right time and wrong time to to switch off. Was there a culture difference from Warrington when Super League started? Because it's sort of semi-pro, pro, <coughs> and went totally pro to. St. Helens when you win a man of steals and things like that. Did the training get harder or different? No, it, it wasn't. It was, it was probably no, no disrespect to, to, to Warrington. It was probably the, the quality of player playing with. And I left I left Warrington. It was it was never about money. It was never about because I didn't I wasn't happy at Warrington, I was, but it was about ambition and it was about playing in big games and winning trophies and play, playing in a Challenge Cup final at Wembley. And Saints had just come off uh, double. 96, 97 back to back Challenge Cup wins, and that's what I wanted. And you know, they had inter international players all over the field. And at the time at Warrington, we just sold Yestin Harris to, to Leeds, Leeds yeah. which was, which for me, was a sign of a lack of ambition. He was probably one of the best, if not the best, player in Super League at the time. And you don't sell them kind of players if you've got ambition to, to go on and challenge for, for major honours. So I asked for for a move, and uh, that's how I ended up at Saints. So when I got to Saints, the the quality of personnel that you're playing with, you know, I think we're, and it's, it's a question you get asked a lot: who, who's the best coach you've worked with? And I've worked with a lot of coaches and a lot, obviously, at St Helens, and they all had their own different things. But we were all successful. But we also had the best team. Yeah. You know, we had some great players, and at the end of the day, it's the players who've got to go out and deliver. Who was the best player that you played with at St. Helens? Like, which one did uh, put you through enough gaps? Yeah, and well, stuff like that? do you know what? I played, I played with some again with some great players: Longy, <coughs> Paul Wellens. Um, but I always, I always say Kieran Cunningham. Um, right. You know, to I played with Kieran. I've known Kieran. We we played together at, at County from from under nines, under tens, and uh, he was always a always a cracking player. Um, but to to do what Kieran did throughout his career, the way he played week in week out, you know, over five hundred games for Saints. Um, at the standard that he did, and you know, he put me for a few tries as well. So it, it must have been a nightmare to play against because he's about as wide as his sofa, yeah, yeah, but he yeah, was yeah. really fast, wasn't he? That, yeah, that yeah, was always, didn't realize. Yeah, yeah real, real good leg speed, real, real explosive and and, and powerful, and yeah, just a, a real smart footballer as well, and you know, a great defender. But as I say, you know, he, he created a lot of opportunities for me as a as a player, and 
Because you look back at them days when you were playing, there's there's so many good players, and you look back and think, oh, yeah. he was the best ever. He was, yeah, you, yeah. Do you know what I mean? And to have them all in the same. Well, team. do you know what? Now we, we talk about salary cap and things like that. Now we we were obviously strictly salary cap when when I was coming through, and you know you look on Sky now when they put these grand final goal fifteen minute snippings of of, of say like two thousand two thousand and two grand final, and you think, can you imagine now trying to trying to fit that team in a salary cap? Because it was, you know, I think we played 2006 Challenge Cup final. We had two or three internationals who couldn't make the 18. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, people now would cry out for them them kind of players. Well, you see now in rugby league, like, you could probably play nearly amateur rugby union and get paid the same as, like, National League rugby league. Do you know what I mean? The, the difference in money is just so different. I think, uh, was it Ashton or was it Wigan? The money he went from Wigan... To go and play rugby union, it wasn't like double, it wasn't triple, it was no, like 10 yeah, times yeah, yeah, the amount, yeah. wasn't it? Just uh, yeah. to, to go, and yeah, play. And, and that's it, you know. But Wigan can only pay it if they've got it, and you know, or the, the, the salary cap allows it. And uh, and that's as you said, for me, one of the things that's holding us back. Well, why did they bring the salary cap in? Was that was that it was, just, it was just to try and get teams going bit, under, to, or? yeah, to try and get a well, to stop, stop clubs going bust and spending money that they, they can't afford, yeah. but also to try and create a better competition because it was quite a split competition between, you know, your top four, top six but the, and, but, and the but, bottom teams. But, but that's still going to be the I, same. Well, I, I was going to say, because isn't it, there's only four teams that have ever won the suit. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so it, it doesn't work. So, 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 for so, me, it doesn't so, work, you know, whether whether people, you know, who run who run these clubs say it does because it, it stops clubs spending more than they can yeah. afford. Um, but... That for me doesn't improve the game. But, but, but it's the exact same in football with the financial fair play thing. Like you, you're essentially you're stopping if if someone wants to buy I don't know a, a West Ham or whatever, and they want to t- and they want to spend a billion pounds over two or three seasons to get them to the Champions League. Like and it's the same in rugby. Like say someone wants to buy Oldham or Whitehaven or whatever, yeah. and they've got a vision to take them right to the top. Well, you're effectively stopping them. Well, that's it. You away. are stopping them. That's what the salary cap and that's what we say. You know that our our game needs more money, needs more investment and. Mm. And how would you get that when you when you're told you can only spend so much and you, you can't buy success? Yeah. I'd I'd just open it up and if somebody wants to invest and, and buy success, then then let them. Yeah. Imagine three like Saudi princes or something just come and bought like national league clubs or something. Just... Well, you, you look at the money that what they they must spend at Man City. Yeah. Um, you can buy rugby league for probably a week's wage. Yeah. <laughs> and the... it's you know. Certainly invest heavily into the into the game. You know, we've we've got a, such a great game, and that's the thing that should attract somebody to rugby is is is, is the core values. Is you know, is everything else that the respect that the, the game holds, and the product on the field. You know, it shouldn't be a hard sell. No, that's what I mean. Like the product's good. Normally, the product's terrible. You're trying to sell everything by the product, the the, the match day experience and stuff. Mm. But when the game's good. Yeah, if you can't sell that, you'd... but but it's a weird one because you look at rugby union and obviously is it just is it just a money thing? Is that, is that all it is? Is that that like is it a sudden thing? Do you know what? And, and and obviously rugby union. I watch some of the club rugby union games and I think I think they're terrible. I I I, I can't bring. Well, the rugby, rugby union, union is it's, it's so big internationally. Yeah. yeah. So you, you know, is it is it something we've got to do more of? More international games, which which we've said, you know, we'd we'd love to do, have more international games. Certainly for England, the, the the more times that you play for your country, the better. Yeah. Especially bringing teams on like Fiji and yeah, teams yeah. Like I that. mean, like, have you know, a series they, against Fiji if you have yeah, to. Yeah, I mean, the, still the game was, you know, whereas probably when I played, it was it was Great Britain, New Zealand, and Australia with with the big ones. But now you look at like Tonga. Yeah, yeah. You know, Tonga beat Australia last year. They beat England. They beat Great Britain. Um, Papua New Guinea beat Great Britain, you know, F- Fiji and Samoa. You know, there's some, there's some good teams. And play the games where people are going to go and watch, you know, like if Ireland plays Scotland, play it in like a white even so you get 8,000 there yeah, so yeah. it looks good. Don't think, I'll tell you what, we're going to play this in London or somewhere that's like that. That's the thing, is, 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 is getting that balance of expansion and, and selling it to, to others and, and letting other people see what it's about and, you know, selling, you selling games out where, where we know we can. Do you, you think know, the, the Magic Weekend and stuff like that's helped, or do you think that's... Because them games, when I watch it on telly, it looks like everyone just comes, watches their team, and a lot of them drift away, don't they? Not all of them, but... And put it in a stadium where you sell it out, so go a little bit small. It just looks better, doesn't mm. it? I think when you're trying to sell it... Yeah, I mean, I, obviously, I, you know, I, can't, I can't speak for, for what, what the financial gain is of, of 
like you said, going up to up to Newcastle. I mean, it's, it's a great city, and it's it is a, it has been a great occasion, you know, when when we've done it. But you know, that in comparison to like you said to to fill in a a DW or yeah. you know a stadium, get everybody. But where the where the people have go, you know, do they do they want that? That weekend away is is that what the big sell is of the, of the magic weekend and I'm sure it is because you know there's a lot of people um, a lot of people were, were so pleased to, to see it go back to Newcastle obviously last year it was at Anfield where you're not going to get fans stopping for all six games because what well, you know if probably the furthest ones away two hours to Hull yeah, yeah. Um, most people will be local. You know, will they drive in, get a ticket for their one day that their, their, their team's playing? Or play it over two days, couldn't you? Maybe have three games. So well, one day and then three games the next day. Well, that's what it is. Oh, right, right. Yeah, oh, right, so, you right. know, it's over two days, over the weekend, so there's six games. So there's there's or well, seven games, whatever it's been in the past when there's been 14 teams. Um, so, yeah, three one day, four the next. Right, and that's right. what it is. That's why in Newcastle, you know, you get majority of people go for the weekend. I know Newcastle's more popular than the Liverpool one, especially for Cumbria people. If it's Newcastle, half of Cumbria goes, yeah, yeah. just because it's only like an hour and a half yeah. or two hours. And it's a great city, though, isn't it? It's, it's all yeah, about the yeah. occasion as well. You know, the stadium's right in the, the city centre. Uh, and, it, and, it and again, you know, we talk about our game. How many other sports could do? You couldn't do it in football. No, no. You couldn't have, you couldn't have 12, 14 teams in the same city over the same weekend and, and have an experience like you get at the Magic Weekend. That's a good thing about rugby league. It's respect at like the lower levels, yeah. isn't it? You know, like after a match, you could be punching the final whistle goes. You end up shaking hands, don't oh, you? It's like you it's, it's you a do. very yeah, that's, unique that, sport. That that's way. an unwritten rule that you know that what goes on the field stays on the field. Do, was that ever awkward for you? Because you had quite a lot of fights when you played. No, when never. You got, <laughs> yeah, most got, of, well, no, no, most of them were, were, were against bloody Great Britain teammates and stuff. Yeah, that's it's, what I mean. You know, like you were, uh, but that's that's. That again, that's the, the the rule of the game. It's it's about that eighty minutes. Anything goes. It's it's about it's about getting on top of your opposition and, and doing anything you can to win the game. Um, and sometimes, if it, if it means, you know, bending the rules, then spark and so be it. <laughs> well, the, 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 I must admit, I never I never ever started one. Yeah, I, I well, I'm just, just going to say the, the the Fitzgibbon <laughs> one. You get elbowed in the face. Yeah, yeah. You're well within your right to give him one. And the Andy Farrell one. At nose of the road, he's sort of swinging at the Fianati, fi- fi- yeah, 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 and he catches you, doesn't he? And I think that just because you go, yeah, well, I, I come in to, to obviously pull him off because you know, <coughs> as I said, he, you know, it was it was three on two at the time, so I'm just I'm just leveling things up, and obviously he's thrown, so you know, it's, it's a red rag to a bull, isn't it? It's um, yeah, but then again, you know, me and Andy are, are really really good mates. You know, I was I was vice captain to him at, at the time for Great Britain, and but. It's the Saints Wigan Derby. It's about it's about winning. Yeah. You find out who's tough in matches like that, though, don't you? Because in training, you'll have these people when you're doing unopposed, the captain's run running dead out. Oh, yeah, yeah. Shouting, yeah. like, oh, yeah, God, yeah. I got me MMA gloves yeah, in the back. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, and then yeah. somebody kicks off, you're like, oh, where's he going? <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? And it's yeah. always best. It's the same on a night out and stuff like that. They're like, oh, the amount of people I've knocked out. And you're like, I've never heard of no, any no. of these people. No. And then <laughs> shit hits the fan, and then it's just the same people, isn't that stand up? Normally, yeah, the ones yeah. that are quiet. Don't talk yeah, about well, like you say, those ones who talk about it are usually not the ones who can back it up. And um, no, but I mean, like, you know, it's the, the great thing with a game is, is you know, it's it's a physical sport, but it never ever leaves the field. No, no, I, I just wondered, just because obviously Andy Farrell was a captain and uh, other players. Because I'm trying to think who else he had a fight with. There's quite a few. If you go on YouTube, and there's a uh... <laughs> yeah, there's been a couple. <laughs> because you won uh, the boxing championship out there, yeah, yeah, Super yeah. League players as well, didn't it? Against I think Lee Radford. Who yeah, Radford's in the final. Yeah. And I think, did you knock all three? Or borderline just knocked all three? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, you should make a comeback now and then more fights. <laughs> know, like, do you know what? I've always been into it, boxing. I, I, I do a lot of boxing training now still, and it's always it's a sport that I've, I grew up training for. Um, so being able to come out of rugby healthy and, and then be able to, to have a go in the, in the ring um, was always something that I wanted to do. So it was, it was yeah, it was good. Did you I tell mean. anyone that you'd done it before? Because they feel like you're probably, oh, I've never done this before. <laughs> <laughs> you're level oh, you're three. What's a glove? You're going yeah, yeah, to talk yourself down, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. It's false sense of security. Uh, that's what I was going to say. Because I can remember watching all the highlights. I've never yeah. heard you mention, say, I've done this for years. This is next minute. Well, well. But would you ever do that as like, um, when you come out of rugby league, did you ever think I'd take up another sport? We're talking Eddie Hall, and Eddie Hall's going to have a go at boxing and things like that. Yeah. Was that ever a, a bit of a lure because um, of name? 
no, not not to no. It, probably a few years down the line, I, I thought maybe I should have done something a bit more. You know, rather than doing it for fun or for charity or whatever, do it a bit more competitively. Um, I don't know at what, what level and don't know. You know, I had a lot of things on. You know, why I finished and, and and I chose to retire from rugby when I did because I had other things as well. Um, I had other things to do, so it probably it probably wouldn't have fitted in anywhere doing. Uh, was it was it tough to retire? Because that's the hardest thing for any rugby player, isn't it? And it, I bet now even when you've had a few cans with your friends, you're watching it on telly, thinking I could have made a difference. And like it, it's very hard to. I, I'm one of them, when I watch rugby, I, I struggle because you think should have been blind there. Should have, and I, even though it was crap at rugby, I, I'm still in. The yeah, head yeah, doing you that. still see. Yeah, yeah, and that's um, yeah. When you're watching games, you you do see things, and and you think um, you know what? Why are they not exploiting that or doing this or you know you did on that and yeah, it does. It's frustrating at, at times, you know, as a, as, a, as an ex player, but. Um, I don't. I don't miss it. I don't miss it. I probably miss it, like when you when you're a guest at the Challenge Cup final or, uh, or the Grand Final, and you see the players walking out the tunnel. They're they're the moments that you you couldn't buy. Well, well you, you say ex professionals and all sports saying that like a lot of times they don't miss the playing. They miss like being in the, the changing room with the lads and like and the camaraderie of it all and like like and having the teammates around them. But they don't actually miss. Yeah, the physical day to day, like you know, the aches and the pains in the body I, and all. See, I'm lucky that I'm still involved in the game, and, yeah. and you know, both at Saints and on the England side as well. So you, you are in and around the players, you with you with the coaching staff, and I've never ever missed that side of things. Um, so, you know, for me, it was was that that thing of running out on the field, you know, to the fans, and yeah. you know, walking out the tunnel in a in a grand final. Um, just a, an unreal feeling, and if you could replicate that every day, you would. Yeah. What was the biggest game that you ever played, and what's the most memorable game that you ever played in? Probably the one that stands out for me: the two thousand and four Challenge Cup final. Was that Millennium? But Millennium Stadium yeah. at Cardiff. Um, that was my first one as captain of Saints, so leading the team out there against Wigan, um, which for me is the, the biggest game in rugby league. Um, probably on the best stadium that I've played at Millennium. I, I love it. You know, I've played at both Wembleys. I've played at Twickenham, I've played at Mirrorfield. Um but Cardiff is is just sensational and to to obviously to get the win and, and lift the trophy um was a was a real special day and even more so that my my younger brother Danny were in the opposition side as well. So it was a it was a big uh, it was a big day for the family. What did your mum and dad do with something like that? Did they yeah, did they have a favourite or was it just like oh just long no, as you don't they, get hurt? They said all along because a lot of the build up that week was uh, was about me and Danny. I think we were the first brothers in sixty odd years to play against each other in a Challenge Cup final, and uh, so a lot of the focus was on us. Like we had Claire Balding at my mum and dad's house doing interviews, and so you know obviously my mum and dad got asked questions, and they just said literally we can't win. You know, we, we, we one's going to win, one's going to lose either way. So said what we'll do is we won't go to any of the, the after parties or anything like that. We'll 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 just go out and go and have a meal and um anyway and after the game uh, our kid said to me and my dad, listen, you you know, your son's just lifted the challenge cup for the first time in his career, you, you go and celebrate with him. So I remember my dad ended up back at our, our hotel and you know with the trophy and yeah it was a it was a good uh, it was a good old weekend. Because that's what you do in rugby. I don't know why I think I've never seen it anywhere else. After you win summit even I've never played in a team that won anything, but we still did it <laughs> like a mad wonder, isn't it? And oh yeah, yeah. It's so yeah. weird because you're going out, everyone else going to work, and you're steaming, dressed yeah. up. It's, <laughs> it's such a weird atmosphere, isn't it? Like people going past. That, like, do you know what? You're about stuff that you do miss. You miss mad wonder. Yeah. That, uh, I was was always at the obviously the back end of the year. You like you, you win a challenge cup there, obviously mid season, uh, and then you play in the following week anyway. So you'd have a you'd have a good drink after the game or the day after, like the homecoming and stuff. But then it's back into back into business. But at the end of the year, the Mad Monday, um, yeah, it was a was, was just a, a time where you know that you've got three or four days with the boys and you're just going berserk. And yeah, it's just it's just a great to have a, have a blowout after after such a, a, a tough year. And I think it's worse because rugby lads are so big, aren't they? And a lot of the lads like they just don't drink hardly all over the year. Yeah. And then they think, oh, I'll tell you what, I'll drink yeah. for three days. And it's such a yeah, weird yeah. mix, isn't it? Yeah. I've been there with them. You've got these fellas, 18 stores, yeah, there's, steam. And- there's some of the, uh, some of the players, you, you have to uh, you have to put your arm around them and, and just, just reel them in a bit at times. Well, we used to go Blackpool. Was that always yeah, where everyone went yeah. to Blackpool, wasn't it? And it's it just, 
the amount of times you think this is going to be a fight between him <laughs> it's just not oh, blood well. yeah, yeah. you just think oh why are you knocking the machine over you like I used to just sit there think, oh, I'm too little to do anything because I used to drink throughout the year because I never got picked so I, I had to practice practicing I guess, practicing so. for my Monday because uh, well, I was always an 18th man I was probably Cumbria's best 18th man and Andy probably doesn't know what that is, but that's yeah. a guy that travels with the team in yeah, case yeah. someone gets injured having breakfast yeah. or warm do, up. And do the warm up and then go and sit on the bench. <laughs> it, Whitehaven was the worst at them teams because you're not full time professional. So you only got like, it means you couldn't go up Saturday night, Friday night, Thursday yeah. night. You travel with the team and you get a free, they were like, oh, you get a free breakfast and you get 30 quid. You're like, I'm 22. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> that's not what I'm wanting to do on a Sunday. And it would end up. With that money, yeah. if you got like a Lucas in and some food and stuff like that, it cost you to yeah, be a fan, to yeah, be a yeah. professional rugby player yeah. on, a, on a Sunday. But no, the, the, the mad Mondays and things like that, I always think if there was scrutiny with uh, the papers and things, they'd just have a field there. Wouldn't they? You just take one camera with one rugby team and people would be in yeah. jail. There would be yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's what that's one thing I've said. Thank God uh, there was no Twitter and as much social media when we uh, played because it was, uh, yeah, it's definitely, uh, definitely highlights things, doesn't it? It's, uh, no, not like we were doing anything wrong, but... <laughs> it, it, I think it's just because it's so imposing as well, isn't it? Especially if you're in fancy dress. Yeah, like, yeah, you're yeah. a big lad. If an old woman's playing bingo and you're steaming at half 11 in the morning <laughs> and you it, it, it's it's such a weird mix. The amount of times I've just looked and you think, oh, God, I feel like watching a documentary or something like yeah, that and everyone yeah. ends up Merry England bar, isn't it, yeah, 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 and yeah. stuff like yeah. that. And It's the blueprint for every do, isn't it? Like, if you went on the Mad Mud, there's normally teams from, like, Yorkshire... And you always think, why didn't we just move it to a Saturday? And it wouldn't feel as bad. You know what I mean? Like, no one's playing rugby. Oh, yeah, but we did Saturday as well. Saturday always went into Monday. Because <laughs> uh, I've seen it, was it Lee Gilmore telling stories about James Graham and people yeah, yeah, like that? Because yeah, yeah. he yeah. seemed like, I, I, I done one evening with, with James, and he, he seems like a dead, like, up for it fella's like, uh, like a, not an intense fellow, but sort yeah, of yeah. focused, isn't yeah. he? So, was that the one where they dyed his hair? They dyed his hair black. Yeah, yeah. His ginger. They dyed his yeah, hair black. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the, he was asleep, so they dyed his hair black. Day, and, day before Great Britain went on tour, so they, they dyed his hair, his, his hair and his eyebrows while he's jet black, while he's asleep. He's got up to absolutely go berserk, and he's punched a window, broke his hand, and missed the GB tour. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's a funny, it's a funny old tale. What, what Gilly tells. And we actually like, had the picture out the other the other week. Picture of the jammer. <laughs> He's trying to run them over as well, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah. That's what you call uh, yeah, a proper Mad Monday weekend with a, a few too many beers. But to, he, uh, he, he's back over uh, Saint Yeah, he is, yeah. He, he played his first game on uh, on Sunday, first time in, in nine years back at Saints. So, yeah, it was good to see uh, good to see jammer back out there. Well, that, when, when we were done the show with uh, James, he was auctioning off a pair of boots that he played in. They look like they come from 1973. Where does it get them made? Yeah. They don't even look yeah. like uh, sort of regular boots. They, I was like, where do they yeah. come from? But yeah. he's, he's like an old school type of prop, tough yeah, as now, yeah, yeah. isn't he? And will, will he make a difference to the St. Helens team? I think, uh, I wouldn't say as, as much now on the field. It's probably more his influence off the field and, you know, around the players and, and bringing on some of the some of the young players just with his, with his experience and his, his competitiveness as well. Yeah. Um, so I think that that's the biggest thing for for Jamma this year. Obviously, he's, you know he's, he's retiring at the end of this year. It's only a, it's only a short term contract, but um, definitely there's a lot of positives to come out of it. Because you've got some really good forward to centre halves, haven't you? You've got like Kyle Lim or Alex Warms and people like that. But you lost Luke Thompson, who I think yeah. at the time yeah. you, there isn't many better forwards. Is that you don't see? No, no, people. he's he's a he is good. He's a good player, is Tom Owen. And, and you know, talking about the the, the difference in in positions now and physicality of them, they the, I think they're the time. Type of players that that are going to excel in, in in rugby league, them athletic, you know, super fit forwards, because of the the way that the, the game's changed and the rules have changed. Um, yeah, and Tomo's uh, obviously had a, a great opportunity to go over to the the NRL, and uh, yeah, now we're Canterbury. Did you ever get tempted to go to Australia or play? Because you apparently got offers to play Union. Yeah, Australian. yeah, I had offers for both. Um, so I had offers with, with Sydney Roosters and Penrith to go over to the NRL. It was very different then. It was, you know, the, the the certainly financially wasn't as big as it is now over there. But I'd say it was bigger over here than it is over here now. Um, but also a big one for me was like I had a I had a young son. I, you know, we had we had Jake then, and uh, just taking him away from from family was probably probably a bigger a bigger thing for no real gain. Certainly not financially. Uh, other than to say you played in the NRL, but I played, you know, I played, I think I played some of my best rugby at international level anyway. It's not like 
you know, you, you had to prove what you what you're about, and could you mix it with the best in the world? I think I've proven that. So, and I had a, I had a, a new five year deal at Saints as well. So, especially if you're like uh, going to get a testimonial and John Bateman, if yeah. you've got kids, it just it's hard. Yeah, it? well, it is. I mean, John Bateman's the the obvious one. Um, proven that you know his, his daughter lives over here, and there, there is more to there's more to playing in the NRL and, and to money. Because um, testimonial for a rugby league player that can set you up, especially for them a couple of years afterwards, where you're transaction and into something else. That to stay around for that testimonial is quite yeah. Quite I mean, I, I was I was lucky. I had, a, I, I had a testimonial. I, I didn't I didn't stay for that reason because I was still quite early into me into my Saints career. Um, but uh, you know, a, a testimonial is certainly a, a, a nice little bonus and a reward for you know for being loyal to to that club. Was that the game that Johnny Vegas played in? No, that was Kieran's. It was oh, Kier- that Kieran's. Oh, yeah, I Kieran's, know. Kieran's, yeah. I, I tell you what, though, he played that game with the highlights uh, on YouTube somewhere, and he'd done a lot of little things right, didn't he? He never got offered a contract. <laughs> yeah. I, just, I always look at that, and I just see that could have been an opportunity he missed yeah. to get Johnny on there. And yeah. a lot of the things, like the first yard's in your head, isn't it? And if, his, <laughs> <laughs> if he could have got in there, maybe just directly yeah, play. Yeah. yeah. Because oh, he looks a lot bigger on there than he is now. Yeah, he is. He's, now, he's, a lot, he? he's a lot bigger on that. Yeah, he's... Um, Probably all these deliveries and that he's been doing is, uh, yeah, he's he's a great fellow, Johnny. You know, and he's he's a mad uh, he's a mad passionate Saints fan. You know, he's really really passionate about the the club and the team. It's brilliant um, what he does for rugby league, though, isn't he? Trying to push the game. Every time he's on telly, he's even got yeah. your t shirt. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Do you know what? Like you say, you know, he's either got my testimonial or or a, or a Saints top, or you know, he's, I mean, his promotion of the Steve Prescott Foundation as well has been has been phenomenal. Um, just the awareness and and obviously the the. Support financially as well. Well, look, y- y- your brother set it up as well, doesn't he? Um, the the mind. Is yeah, it? state of mind. State of mind. How, how tough was that for when your brother? I forgot to mention about your brother. And, yeah, because um, he was a great player himself. Yeah, yeah, he was. Yeah, yeah, and you know, I say that, that probably one of my highlights was that was that game against Danny in the final. To you know, to see him out there on on the biggest stage as well um, was something he de- he deserved. Certainly when you know he had he had some tough times early in his career. You know, he's, he's type one diabetic as well, which always complicated any any injuries that he's that he had and he took a backward step to to go to to Rochdale in the in the championship from from Super League but you know proved what he was about and then signed at Wigan and then sort of playing next thing he's playing in a in a challenge cup final was was great but yeah he had some he had some tough times and you know he uh, he had a couple of a uh, couple of bad injuries and illnesses that that obviously that saw the end of his uh, his career and, and you know he went he went through some dark dark moments but you know thankfully he come out and you know he's he's just telling his story now to to try and inspire others to to speak up and you know if people are struggling to 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 come out and 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 seek help and, and it, that's it's the good great though thing, isn't it, it? I, like because in rugby league it's not especially when I played that you'd never say you had anything wrong with you. even when like no, you're dropping nose or emo- like emotions would be the last yeah, yeah. thing you think I'm on painkillers well, I mean our, our kid you know he does his talks and, and sometimes he does get emotional doing it and they, they, they see the, the true passion that, that's behind it and you know if you can if you can see that from a 17 stone yeah, 6 foot yeah. 4 rugby player then but hell it's, uh, it's anybody can speak then can't they you know it's it's not it's it's t- it's it's tough to to do that, not to not do it. Well, you, I think I seen that quote about the football people pretending they're ill for the full eighty minutes or ninety minutes in football and rugby league. Pretending, pretending they're not. Ah, you pretend you're not. <laughs> and that, I think that goes off the field as well, doesn't it? Like the amount of rugby players that you hear, you're like, "Gosh, you were going through that. You wouldn't have thought yeah, so. You're yeah. down there laughing. Yeah, and yeah. So, like, how, how many? And that's it. Are... But we don't want you know we don't want that. And that that's where the great message is that you know if you are struggling, don't don't hide it. Don't don't think you you've got to you've got to you know, put on this front, you know, speak out and get help and that's the only way that, that things improve. And rugby league has led the way in, in yeah. that message coming across and, and as I say, our, our kid's been one of the leaders in that. Well, I've, I've seen your brother being tagged in loads of times, just saying like amateur players, like, oh, I've gone through this time with my wife feeling down and your brothers have reached out to them. I've yeah, seen yeah, it on yeah, Twitter yeah, and things like yeah, that. Yeah, he does and, and that's a great thing as well that, that players are accessible, you know, players, past players, whatever. Um, you know, and you can make a difference. No, and it, it's at all levels as well. We always look at the Super League level, but there's players that were like semi-professional, but that was their income for years, no qualifications. Then they're left into the real world, aren't they? It's a big jump, isn't it? And you find a lot of players are still hanging on, they lose relationships and things because of it. And then at the end of the, the day, they're sort of there. And it's nice that if if you are going through something, you can just reach out. Everyone knows who to message now. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah that's well. it. And I think the rugby league have been really good with that as well. And you know, I got asked the other day, somebody it was a, it was a football guy, and he says, well, "Why was Tony Adams involved with rugby? What, what's his association? Why why was he the RFL president?" I said, "Because his company, Sporting Chance, have probably put five or six hundred rugby league players through his program. You know, in regards to gambling addiction, alcohol addiction, depression. You know, and, and so it was one of Tony Adams' his, his um, workers, Colin Bland, who, who, who sorted our kid out. And that was through Sporting Chance, through the RFL, who, who got him on the road to recovery. And it, Tony Adams is such a passionate guy about our, our sport and obviously the, the work that his, his, his charity have done has helped a lot of people, what people don't know about, because yeah. it's not something that you shout about and it's not something that's, that's broadcast. But, you know, him and his, his charity have helped a lot of people within rugby league. Uh, well, I first started in about, I think it was Francis Maloney. And oh, I was yeah. talking to Francis Maloney and he, he was saying, yeah, I, I tried to kill myself. So I thought, oh my God, like, you, in my head when you were younger, you just assume these international players just went on to someone else. And there isn't enough jobs for coaches, is there? Not every player that finishes can be a coach. And no. the amount of players that I've struggled, I, I, I was surprised. Well, most people like you meet, even when we were like Ricky Atkins and people like that, every sport has the same thing. And I, th I think rugby league's probably leading the way, aren't they, compared to football and boxing and things like like helping out yeah, yeah. and for somewhere to go to. Does, like, but there seems to be that, like, because it's it's such a small, like, sport, like, compared in comparison to football, that, that, like that the, there always seems that, like, yeah, it's that more yeah, close yeah. community that thing, isn't it? Whereas a lot of times in football, you can almost be forgotten about because yeah, yeah. The, the turnaround is so quick, or, like, constantly, and it's, yeah. uh, it's it's such more of a bigger sport. Yeah. Think, so. No, it is, it, is, it is a close community. And, you know, you see some of the other stuff, you know, from Steve Prescott, Danny Jones, yeah, yeah. all this, you know, obviously with Rob Burrow going through what he's going through now, and... It's hard I'll, to watch, I'll, isn't I'll, it? I'll, it's, yeah, it's, I, I, it's tragic because you, you know you you personally know all these people as well, but also that it's heartwarming that the support that they get well, that and, and how people one, pull it's... together d despite who you support. Mm. You know, we, we we took a table, so I I got a, a group of me and Gary Connolly got a group of lads, so all the like the Lancashire lads, Chris Joint, you know, Mick Cassidy, uh, Chris Radlinski. We took a table at Rob Burrow's game and. You know, you couldn't you couldn't get a ticket for for that game. We had a we had a table in the in the corporate just to see the people that were there and, and supporting him, and, and then a sellout crowd at, at Edinley was just phenomenal. And everybody with every different club shirt on, but you know, so they're supporting Rob. No, no, that, like you said, the Rob Butter one was just hard to watch, wasn't it? I think it's because you've seen a lot of fella that was brilliant at rugby, and how tough is he? He's yeah, foot yeah. four, something yeah. like that. He's played a career that no one expected because. He's so little, isn't yeah, he? Yeah. Like, no one expected him to do so well. And then to go through something like that, I just found it. Watching that game when he come on as well, wasn't it? You just yeah, saw yeah. emotion in the stands. And oh, God, like it was uh, it was heartbreaking watching. I remember, like I said, we, we went and stood outside and, and watched the game. And, yeah, it was... Uh, it was certainly uh, certainly an emotional thing watching him uh, watching him run. Especially when he was playing, because I didn't think he'd come on and play. I thought, I've, imagine John Key targeting him, you know, like, get up that channel. <laughs> know, up that <laughs> I know, knowing Robbie as well, he put him on the back. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, just a, a, again a, a great ambassador for our sport and you know a phenomenal player. Uh, before we finish, obviously involved with England, what's the chances of beating Australia? Because always get drunk, go at the pub, watch it, and for a few years I've been disappointed. You know, and you just think now we're, we're going to do it this year. We're going to. Yeah, we... and as I say, I was really excited with um, with the Ashes series coming up this year. Unfortunately, obviously that's not going ahead now. Um, so the next big one really is is obviously the, the twenty twenty one World Cup. Um, but you know there'll be there'll be a lot of preparation this year still you know within the England setup to to be as as best as we can for uh, for next year. Where, where's it being played? The World Cup twenty twenty one. So it's in in the UK. Oh, is it in the yeah, UK? Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. So it's um, yeah. I mean, games all over. Um, but it's 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 going to be you know John Dutton and his his team have done a, a magnificent job over the last four years in, in promoting that and getting everything you know set up ready to uh, ready to go this year. And what's going to be different this time? Is it a different soundtrack in the changing rooms, or is it going to be? Uh... Uh, do you know what? I think the biggest thing is 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 Sean knows the players. Yeah. I think the the way that they'll play it'll be it'll be a lot more simple because you know international level, unfortunately, with with club commitments and that, you don't get that much time with the players. Um, you know, it's going to be going into a big World Cup competition, but you're not going to have a lot of time in, in preparation. So a lot of the preparation is being done now and feeding the drip feeding the, the players information on, on what's expected, what an England player looks like, 
what we want as as coaches f- from them players, both see it in Super League to to get your selection for for that team, and then you know what's expected when uh, when com- competition comes around. And uh, yeah, I just think Sean's passion and as I say, his, his knowledge and and his, his his knowledge of the players and and picking the right squad. That, that that's the thing. Pick the squad on like on form. And it's motivating, isn't it? At that level, do you know what I mean? Yeah, because you're not going to have six it, months. It, it is, his got... biggest thing is, is his man management and his motivation as well. So, obviously, you know, giving him the, the right information, but also inspiring players as well. And you've you, you've you've got players in Australia. Do you, do you think that will benefit our team internationally? George Williams and people like that playing there. Yeah, of course it does. You know, and not necessarily saying that them, them players will be in or, or that you know they are the better players. But yeah, I mean, players who are playing in the competition with the opposition players and, and knowing them, um, you know, and playing in the, in the, the NRL is the, is the best competition in, in, in rugby league. Uh, it, yeah, it can only benefit. No, anyways, uh, but uh, cheers for coming on, Paul. We'll, we'll wrap it up there. Pleasure. Cheers. Lovely house as well. Paul. No, cheers. 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 Cheers.